Welcome back to another Bible Lounge. Today we're going to be in Romans part 3. We will be covering Romans chapters 5 through Romans chapter 8. This section, Paul is now addressing the believer in, in the sense of the gospel worked out in the life of the believer. There's an awesome section of book of Romans. It's an awesome section of scripture. There's so much meat. It was really hard for me to summarize this section as, as small as I possibly could, but nevertheless, such a great section of scripture. Uh, two things I want to mention before I jump into the section. First, you need to make sure you're memorizing the chapter summaries. Okay. The chapter summaries are extremely important. That is the number one way you're going to learn the book of Romans, at least through this um, video series, because the chapter summaries describe it as, as they in, in, you know, imply, right? Chapter summaries, they describe the chapter and, and the, I, really they describe the main focus of the chapter. Now, again, that doesn't mean everything in the chapter is summed up in the summary, but that means that Paul's primary argument, his primary flow of thought is captured in the chapter summaries that I've listed. All right, so it's important that you memorize those. If you have not watched any of the other Romans videos, click on the Bible Lounge name down below. Look for the series called Made Easy and you will find the Romans series and, and start watching it from the intro. Okay, number two, I just want to make sure that I give credit where credit is due. I don't want to be uh, accused any, of, of any plagiarism or anything like that. I don't think it's that big of a problem, but I just, I just thought it would be a good thing for me to give credit where credit is due. So some of the chapter summaries that I listed, for instance, Romans chapter one, all are accountable to God or all people are accountable to God for sin. So I'd summarize chapter one like that, whereas I, I took it from, I, I didn't necessarily come up with it. I took it from a book written by Moo Douglas, a well-known scholar. He wrote pretty much, it's to the top rated commentary on the book of Romans. It's from the New International Commentary series. It's a 900 page uh, volume of Romans. It's an amazing literary work on the book of Romans. But he summer, I mean, he, he has an outline in there where he is outlining various sections and one of his sections, it's, and it, it entails more than chapter one, I believe, or actually less than chapter one, that all are accountable to God for sin. And I took that and I used it for the whole chapter. So I want to give credit to him for coming up with that chapter summary. I don't know if he made it up. I don't know if he got it from another commentary. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I even have to credit somebody just for using the, the title to a section. I just felt like I should. And the main reason is I couldn't come up with a better one. It's such a great example or, or, or summary of the chapter. Uh, the only other option that I had was all are without excuse. That's a little shorter. I guess I could have used it, but I like all are accountable to God for sin. It, it conveys that idea that we have sin and we're accountable to God for it. Okay. So I just wanted to give credit to Moo Douglas. Never met him before. Just read the commentary and, and wanted to use some of those headings because I think they are beneficial. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the book of Romans chapters 5 through chapter 8. All right, so let's get into it. So before we get into 5 through 8, Romans chapters 1 through 4, if we remember, it set up the premise. It set up the, the issue with mankind, the issue with humanity. And the issue with humanity is that all of humanity, and this includes Jews and Gentiles, are accountable to God for sin. Nobody has an excuse before God. All are guilty and are under God's judgment. But we know in chapter 3 and then in chapter 4, God provided the way out of that judgment through Jesus. And if we place faith in Jesus, we will be justified, which is a legal term that means declared righteous. So righteousness is attained by faith. And that goes for the Jew and the Gentile. And so we get to chapters 5 through 8. So chapter 5, Paul now goes on his theme with the justification and now how that justification is sort of working in the life of the believer. 
And so in chapter five, he he talks about now that we have been justified, we have peace with God. See, we're no longer at enmity with God like how we were before. We're no longer under God's judgment. We're no longer enemies with God. We're now family of God. We're now at peace with God. That's what that means. It means that we're, we're no longer against God. We're now for him. We're now with him. We're now on his side. And we also have access into his grace, Paul says in this first section of Romans chapter 5. We have access into his grace. God's grace is, is such an amazing thing. And it is, it is by how we were, are saved. And that's Ephesians uh, chapter 2, um, 8 through 10. Talks about that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. So again, the idea is, is, is faith and God's grace working through faith. God's grace, if you want to define it, it's, it's Jesus. God's grace is Jesus. It's, it's, it's displayed perfectly on the cross. And then Paul goes on to say, those who are justified have been given the spirit. In, in fact, he says it in a very eloquent way. Basically, God's love has been poured into our hearts. So we have the fullness of God's love. And that is by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and what this does, what God's love, what God's grace does for us, is it enables us to then see our suffering as something that produces hope. So because God has love for us, we have hope in the future resurrection, the future yet yeah, resurrection, the future glorification. So knowing how much God loves us, we can hope in the future glorification. And so Paul continues on this thought of God's love. And he even goes on to describe how amazing that love is in that God sent his son to die for us while we were still his enemies. As I just mentioned, as, as really Paul just mentioned, we're no longer his enemies, right? We have peace with God. But when we were at enmity with God, that's when he died for us. He didn't die for us when we were seeking him, when we were at peace with him. He died for us when we were sinners, when we were against him, when we were his enemies. And that's when he died. And, and God's love is shown in that he died for his enemies. And so Paul's saying, if God's love was shown so great in that he died for us while we were still sinners, how much more does God's love show in that he will bring us to our future redemption? And this actually brings up an important aspect of salvation. It is, it is a, our salvation is, is sort of a two part salvation. Okay. We are saved now. Those who are justified are saved. It, they have passed from death to life. We are abiding in Jesus's resurrected life. We have died to our old self. We have been justified as Paul has already been stated, stating we have grace. We have access. We have peace with God. Or we have access into grace is what I was going to say. We have peace with God. So, we are saved, but at the same time, we're not in heaven. We don't have a resurrected body like Jesus is. So our salvation is not fully realized. Okay, we are saved spiritually, but we have this body of flesh. My body is still under the old realm. It is this this body is still part of the 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 earth. It's still it's still subject to decay and death and therefore I need a new body and that is the hope that I long for that is the hope that Paul tells us that that God's love poured in our hearts produces in us and and ultimately suffering helps to produce it gives us a hope for that future resurrection or if you will we can call it glorification just as Jesus was glorified so also will all of those who are justified we will be glorified and and we live in light of that hope. And then Paul goes on to describe now living out that hope, living out the gospel in our lives and, and how we can be assured of that future hope. And the reason why is because, first of all, how sin entered the world. Okay, Sin entered the world through Adam. Adam can now be seen as like a figurehead. This doesn't mean that he is necessarily in hell okay that's not what this means it just means that that there's two figureheads there's a there's a, a human figurehead of the old world of of the fleshful people and then there's a human figurehead of the spiritual people and that is Jesus of course so adam right adam was created he was created essentially perfect he didn't sin up until the point, of course, before he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't have sin. He didn't have death. There was no sin and death in, in terms of, of humanity. Okay, There was no sin and death in the world. 
Now, that's debatable. Some people debate that. I'm just going based on what I believe. But there was no sin and death in the world. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5 that Adam brought sin and death into the world. And that Adam brought sin and death because of his trespass. His one trespass brought sin and death. And so everybody, because we're all born after Adam's trespass, all human beings now are, are, are born in the state that Adam was when he had all of us, which ultimately he was kicked out of the garden. He, was, he brought sin and death. And so every human being now was born under that realm of sin and death. And ultimately he is now the figurehead of all of those that are in that realm, abiding in judgment. That is the realm where we're all guilty. We're all accountable to God for sin. And, and so we need a way out. We need to be removed from that realm and, and, and transferred into a realm where there is no sin and death, where there's a realm of life. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. So through one man's trespass, sin and death entered the world and sin spread to all men, not only because of all of us are in that realm, but also because we all sinned, Paul says. So we prove ourselves to be no better than Adam because we also sinned. So we're all at fault. We're all guilty. But Jesus provided a way. He became a new Adam. He lived under the old realm of Adam, only he lived very different than every other human, including Adam, because he never sinned. So he was able to become a new type of Adam, so to speak. He was able to become a, a, uh, the, the figurehead of a new realm, a new humanity. And so everybody who places his faith in Jesus now is, 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 this is kind of the idea of being born again. We're transferred from that realm. We are no longer abiding in the realm of Adam, the realm of sin and death and wrath. We're now abiding in the realm of Jesus. So by identity, we're no longer sinners. We're no longer under wrath by identity. We're now in the realm of Jesus. And of course, this doesn't mean we don't struggle with sin. We do. We do struggle with sin, but it's very different. Because now our struggle with sin is we just struggle living out the righteousness that God sees in us. Whereas before, there was no righteousness in us. We had righteous acts, but we were not righteous. We weren't declared righteous. Believers now are justified. They're declared righteous. And we are required to now live out that righteousness. We'll see this in Romans chapter 6. But nevertheless, the whole point is through Jesus' obedience, through Jesus' sinless life and his sacrifice on the cross, his, his, his one action of obedience, his, his death on the cross, his, his righteous living, he enacted something that outweighs the other realm. So grace triumphs over the other realm of sin and death. And so with this thought, Paul will move on into chapter six and he'll ask the question then, what then shall we say that, that we should sin so that grace abounds even more? And we'll answer that when we get to chapter 6. But essentially, that's Romans chapter 5. Uh, I forgot to mention the summary. The summary is dead to Adam, alive in Christ. Again, that doesn't mean Adam's this wicked person. It just means he became the type of figurehead for all of humanity. And we need to be saved from that realm and transferred to the realm of Jesus, the realm of life, the realm of grace, the realm of peace with God, the realm of justification. We are justified. We are declared righteous. We are dead to the old realm, the realm of Adam. So dead to Adam, alive in Christ. All right, so we get to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 can be summarized like this. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. Very similar motif as dead to Adam, alive in Christ. Only this time, Paul Paul continues on. And like I said, he, he proposes a, a statement in chapter 5 by saying where, where sin increased, Grace increased all the more because it takes more grace to overcome that sin, of course. That's the point. The point is that grace will never lose the battle with sin. And then he says in chapter 6, he opens up, well, what then? Should we sin so that grace may abound? And Paul says, of course not. This, this is a dumb question, right? The, 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 the reality is because we are now people who are no longer under that old realm with, with the sin and the wrath and the judgment and, and living as enemies of God, and we are transferred to the realm of righteousness. We are declared righteous in God's eyes. God sees Christ's blood on us. We are, we are um, abiding in God and in Jesus and in his grace. That means our identities are different. And we need to live out that new identity. The behaviors of the believer should match the identity God has given us. And this is, this is so important is that the Christian life is not somebody trying to be righteous. 
The Christian life is somebody who has accepted the righteousness of God through Jesus as by means of faith, faith in Jesus. We are justified. We are declared righteous. And now we have an ID card, if you will. I'm kind of um, loosely using Paul's language. Um, not really Paul's language, but kind of loosely trend, uh, interpreting what Paul's saying here. But ultimately, we have a ID card, the believer. You have an ID card that says child of God, believer, righteous, holy. It says these things, citizen of heaven, right? And, and we need to understand this doesn't mean that our conduct is righteous. This doesn't mean that we are automatically just, just good people. But at the same time, now our behaviors must match that of our ID cards. That's what Paul's saying. So, so for us to say, let's continue in grace so that sin may abound, that's, that's foolish because we're people of this new realm. So we need to behave as people of this new realm. We need to behave like Jesus. So faith is now uh, uh, something that produces in us, not just a declared righteousness that God declares us righteous, but it also produces in us a righteous attitude, a righteous behavior, a desire to be righteous, just like Jesus is righteous. And, and that, that, that can be called sanctification. That's the process of sanctification. But Romans chapter six is all about that. It's all about, hey, look, you are righteous. God has set you free from the realm of sin and death. In fact, this is kind of the whole chapter, what it's about. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer entrapped by sin in its in its chains and its bondage, right? We know the famous song, my chains are gone, I've been set free. We've been set free from what? From sin and from death, from that realm that held us captive, from the inability to follow God. Now we have the Holy Spirit and we're no longer enslaved to sin. It is no longer binding us. We've been released and we are now abiding in grace and we're called to live out a life of righteousness. So Paul, Paul uses this idea that we were slaves to sin. We've been released and now let's be slaves to righteousness. Let's be slaves to righteousness. In the same way we were obedient to our evil and sinful desires, and some of us more than others, right? Of course. It doesn't mean we were all like pursuing murdering people and that. It doesn't mean that's not what that means. It's just we all we all lied. We all we all kind of had selfish motives and intentions and, and we still do even as believers and, and that's why we're we need to work at it, right? We need to have selfless intentions and behaviors. But but it, to do so, it requires us to submit our bodies, to submit our minds, our thoughts, all of our life before God as slaves, as slaves, the way we used to be slaves to sin and righteousness, now let, to, to sin and death. Now let's be slaves to grace and righteousness. Let's, let's pursue righteousness without holding back. Righteousness must be the thing that we seek, and it's not because we just want to be righteous to show people how righteous we are. It's because we are people in a new realm. We are people with an ID card that says we are righteous and we must live that righteousness out. That's what Paul is ultimately saying. And he ends kind of chapter six with this thought that also he, he brings in the law that, that, that being dead to sin, also especially for the Jew, means being dead to the law. Because the law was binding on the Jew. Because the Jew couldn't fulfill the law. Because the Jew couldn't satisfy the righteous requirements under the law. Meaning they couldn't, they couldn't follow every law. No Jew can live under the law and stand before God and say, I followed it 100%. That's, that's impossible. And so even the Jew was guilty. We learned that in chapter 2. And so Paul brings that up again in chapter 6. That, that the Jew is set free from the law, which was sin and death for the Jew. And now they are alive in Christ. And so chapter 7, he's going to continue on that idea, especially towards the Jew. He's going he's gonna to talk to the Jew specifically and address the Jew and the law and, and what that looks like. Okay, so chapter 6, dead to sin, alive in Christ.